to all of you people this morning. But I just want to assure you that you look a lot different to me this morning, too. I can see as The last time that Dr. Clock was away ministering, I, <coughs> I asked him how it went when he came back. And he said that he had a real fine time of ministry. But one thing that bothered him was the fact that um, where he was sitting, th he was surrounded by people that were not paying attention to the person who was ministering. And uh, he said that to some people, Christianity is going to church on Sunday. This was their form of Christianity. And he said, well, that, that's a shame. And it really is. But you know, being religious today is not something that's out of style. Being religious today has become quite fashionable. It's the in thing for some people. Statistically, more people are going to sh church today, percentage-wise, than ever before. People are flocking to churches. There's a show that comes on late at night that I watch once in a while. I don't recommend it, but I watch it anyway. It's called The 700 Club. And uh, <coughs> they were very, very excited because of one report that they made, one uh, survey that they made. And the survey showed that people are just flocking to churches, whether it was uh, Protestant churches, Catholic churches, Mormon churches, whatever it was, people were becoming religious. People were starting to go to church. And these people, they were all excited. This is great. But it's not great. So what? People are going to church. The expression born again is very familiar now, too. <coughs> As we know, we see it all over. In the last presidential election, the three presidential candidates that were running for office, every, all three of them, claimed to be born again Christians. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and Jimmy Anderson. Years ago, that would be a mark against a guy. But now, it's fashionable to become, or to be known as a born-again Christian. The beginning of religion, or religion has its roots in, in Genesis, in the fourth chapter of Genesis, I believe, where Cain and Abel <coughs> bring their offerings before the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offerings, it says. But Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. The Lord's specified and prescribed manner of offerings was that a shed, a, a bloodshed sacrifice was to be done. But Cain went his own way. Cain wanted to get to God his way, and so he sacrificed, or he offered to God fruits of his own labor, and God had n no respect for that. And this is the beginning of religion, man's way to get to God. Are you religious? You know, I expressed my feelings a while ago that I thought that when we had visitors come into this church, whether they were saved or unsaved, some of them felt very comfortable here. They didn't know that there was a difference between being religious and being a Christian, but there's a big difference. If walking down those stairs on Sunday morning is Christianity to you, and something is really wrong. But to some people, coming to church, doing good, is their form of Christianity, but it's religion. I remember talking to my father recently. <coughs> I was over at his house. I was just about to leave, and a television commercial came on with the president of the Chrysler Corporation of Canada. The man's name was Lee Iacocca, 
and he literally transformed the cr the um, almost bankrupt Chrysler Corporation into a brand new company that's making lots of money. But anyway, he's a very successful man, and uh, my father likes successful men. He admires people who can uh, do things like that and make a lot of money. <coughs> and if you know who he is, you'd say he's a really nice guy, because he, he really seems like a friendly, good-hearted man. And when the commercial was over, my father said, you know, Paul, that man is a daily communicant. I said, daily communicant, what's that? He goes to Mass and receives communion every day. That's great. What does that mean? <laughs> That's probably why he's so successful. He's a good man. He's a religious man. Every day he goes. But Dad, he's a sinner. Dad, he's not born again. Dad, he's lost. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 8, the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to some very, very religious people. The Pharisees. Beginning at verse 41, he said, You do the deeds of your father. They accused him. Then said they to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came forth from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? And Jesus said to these very religious men, You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. The Apostle Paul broadened this scope for us in that he said in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 2, that the Ephesian believers, before they were saved, not only were they children of the devil, but that they were moved by the devil. They were propelled by the devil. They were energized by him. Paul says, and you, believers, has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works or now energizes in the sons of disobedience. But he's a good man, my father said. He goes to church every day. He's a good citizen. Look what he's done. He's successful. People respect him. Dad, he's lost. He's religiously lost. David in Psalm 51 said that he was shaped in iniquity. In other words, before he was born in his mother's womb, he was a sinner. We're all sinners by nature. In Adam, God sees us in Adam having sinned. Religion cannot take that away. No matter how good we try to be, we can never take that away. This man who my father respects lacks the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 says, If any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. What were the people, what were the religious people of Jesus' day considered in the eyes of Christ? The Pharisees, those who kept the letter of the law, Jesus called them 
names, if I might say. In Matthew chapter 23, let's turn there. These guys would be considered the archbishops of today, maybe the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church. And they said, Jesus said to them, you are blind guides. You strain at the gnat and swallow a camel. What do you mean by that? In those days, they understood full well what Jesus was saying. To us, it's hard to understand. But he was saying to them, he was referring to how they strain their, what they drink, their juice or their wine. They would pour it over some kind of a screen. And they would strain out the little wee gnats, the smallest, maybe the smallest insect that they would know. They would strain it out. But the Lord says, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. In other words, you're very, very concerned with the minor issues, but the big ones, the important ones, you're not concerned about. They weren't concerned about their sins. They were concerned about their prestige. Jesus was exposing these men, and they weren't concerned about that. He goes on and says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Outside they were clean. Outside they were shining. To the men around them, they were good men. But inside, where it counts, they were full of extortion and excess, he said. He was exposing them. You blind Pharisee, in verse 26, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Listen, if your heart is right with the Lord, if the inside is taken care of, that will take care of the outside. First, take care of the inside verse 27 woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you are like whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness in those days they used to take lime finally lime very white lime and lime is white and they used to whitewash the tombs the sepulchers to make them beautiful on, on special occasions when when dignitaries would be coming in from other places they would really do a super job their their graveyards their their sepulcher yards or whatever you want to call them were beautiful the outsides of them were just as white as snow and Jesus said, you guys are just like that, you religious hypocrites. Outside, you're a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. But inside, you stink. You're rotten and you're full of corruption. And that's what we are if we're not saved. We can put on all kinds of acts on the outside. What's on the inside, that's where it counts. No matter how much the sepulcher was clean, no matter how much it was whitewashed, he never did a thing to the inside. Same with our outer life and our inner life. Even so, ye outwardly appear righteous unto men, he says in 28, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. This reminds me of my very own car. 
Now, if you don't know what my car is, which one is mine out there, it's the one that's dying of cancer. And uh, not only is the outside rotting away, full of holes, but what makes it go is dying too. Pretty soon we're going to have to bury it. My car's in pretty rough shape. You know the Mile Hill out there? Well, some people think that uh, I have trouble with that Mile Hill with my car. There's no real trouble at all, because on the way here, just no problem at all. No, the point is, my car's in bad, bad shape. My wife, when she comes to ladies' Bible study, I have to pray for her all the way she's driving here, because I, I want her to get here. I'm going to fix it. That car's going to run beautiful. I'm going to get Mike. I'm going to get Frank, Pat, Danny, John, Jim, Rick. I'm going to get all the boys together one day. Jerry, you too. We're going to go down to Rick's garage. We're going to get our grinders out. We're going to get our sandpaper out. We're going to get our primer out. We're going to get our paint and our compressor, and we're going to work on the body of that car all day, and we're going to make that a new car. It's going to run beautiful. I'm going to fix it. Is it going to run any better? It's going to be the same lousy car it is today if I fix the body. And that's what people are doing who are reforming, who are trying to reform themselves to get to Christ. They're doing a body job. Nicodemus was one of these men here. I don't know if he was present, but he was a Pharisee. He was a very religious man. He knew he lacked something. We all know the story well. Who was Nicodemus? The John chapter 3 says a couple of things about him. He was a religious man. He was a ruler of the Jews, a ruler of God's people. He saw miracles. Verse 1 of chapter 3 said, or verse 2 says, uh, We know that thou art a man come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost. He saw the miracles of Christ. He knew who Christ was. He spoke with him privately. In verse 10, the Lord Jesus said, you're a teacher of Israel. He had a whole pile of qualifications as far as the world is concerned. But Jesus said to him, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Was it necessary for Christ to die on the cross for the sins of the world? Was it necessary? Yes. Verse 14 of this chapter Christ said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the must, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The same word Christ said in verse 7 to Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. You just don't add to our old life. We just cannot reform our old lives. We have, to, we have to make this known to people, that reformation of our old life, becoming religious, isn't the way to God. In, John, in Matthew chapter 12, the Lord, in pronouncing judgment upon Israel, likens Israel to a man with an unclean spirit. In, John, in Matthew 13, 43. And uh, I'm just going to use this portion just for application purposes. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return into my house from which I came out. And when he has come out, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goes and takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. 
even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. He likens Israel to a man with an unclean spirit, with bad habits, with a lot of religion. The unclean spirit goes out of the man. You get rid of your bad habits. You quit smoking, you quit drinking, you quit swearing, you reform yourself. And then something happens. Because you've tried to do it on your own, then he says, the unclean spirit says, I will return into my house from which I came out. And when he has come, he finds a change. When the bad habit comes back, there's a change. The house has been swept clean. It's beautifully decorated. It's garnished. But there's one big problem. He says he finds it empty. The Spirit of God isn't there. So he goes and he re get seven other spirits worse than himself and he comes back and the last estate is worse than the first. Self-reformation doesn't work. If a person hasn't got the spirit of God, he's empty. He's without hope. In Matthew chapter 9, the Lord Jesus again speaking reference to the Jews <clears throat> verse 16 he says no man puts a piece of new cloth on an old garment for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and the tear is made worse neither do new neither do men put new wine into old wineskins else the wineskins break and the wine runs out and the wineskins perish but they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, this is very difficult for us to understand what Jesus was trying to get at. Because, for one thing, our clothes and our materials that we use today aren't the same. And we don't have wineskins, per se. We have bottles. But what Jesus said meant a whole lot to these people, because they understood. In those days, cloth was made of hand-woven, all-wool fabric. And uh, when these fabrics were washed and exposed to the elements, there was a tremendous amount of change in the texture of the garment and a tremendous amount of shrinkage. Just ask my wife how much wool sweaters shrink. I had a wool sweater one time. Joel's wearing it today. but. There's a tremendous amount of change. <clears throat> if you have an old garment, your old manner of life, reformation, religion, and you put a patch of new material on it that hasn't been shrunken yet, what's going to happen? The piece of garment that you have will tear when the new patch that you've put on starts to shrink, it will pull it apart. So do you put a new piece of cloth on an old garment? You don't do it. They didn't do it. And Jesus said he doesn't do it either. You don't reform your old life. You throw it out and you get a new one. Neither do men put new wine into old wineskins. The wineskins they had in those days were goat and sheepskin. A new skin was soft and flexible and elastic. When you put new wine into it and the wine fermented and expanded, so the skin expanded with the wine. You put new wine into new wineskins. But if you put new wine, unfermented wine, into an old hard, dried-out wineskin that cannot expand. The fermenting action of the wine will burst the wineskin, and both the wine and the skin will be destroyed. You put 
new wine the joy of heaven in new wineskins in new people born of God people today are trying to patch their old style of life with a new patch of religion or even the gospel some people use this new patch in the form of of baptism for example church membership praying for a long time some people even fast but the big thing is they lead the good life and they think that's going to commend them to God I hope there's not one of us in this room today that is doing that and I, and I, I don't think there is what about us this morning that are saved what about the good life for us what's the difference then there's a big difference an unsaved person is trying to live a life pleasing to the Lord out of the flesh but a person has been saved doesn't do that we're not working for our salvation it's been provided for us but it's not by works of righteousness which we have done Titus in Titus 3 5 but according to God's mercy he saved us now that we've been saved what's our responsibility well in Sunday school here all the kids know Ephesians 2 8 and 9 what does verse 10 say verse 10 is very important for the Christian <clears throat> for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them I find in this verse an expressed purpose of why we were saved we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works you see that the salvation first the good works follow not good works try to get salvation in Titus 2.14 Paul says that God has taken to himself a peculiar people that are zealous of good works it should be an outgrowth of our salvation and in verse 3 chapter 3 verse 8 he says that we should be careful to maintain good works because of the salvation that we have there's a big difference there's a world of difference between a person who is saved and a person who is unsaved as far as good works are concerned a person who is unsaved performs good works which are in God's eyes filthy rags according to Isaiah 64 the difference between a person saved and unsaved a person unsaved is working for his salvation but we according to Philippians 2 are working out our salvation when Paul said my beloved as you have always obeyed not in my presence only but mu now much more in my absence work out your own salvation he wasn't telling them to earn it he was telling them to express it to work it out I hope this morning that when we are being observed by people who try to reform their lives by themselves to get to Christ I hope they know there's a difference I hope they know that we're not in the same boat as them that we've already been saved and the good works that we perform are an outworking of the salvation that we already have in Christ for eternity 
It's very important for us as a body of believers that when people that we don't know of come into this church, that we make it known to them that we're not a bunch of religious people that come in here Sunday morning and sit down, but that we have been born of the Spirit of God and there's a difference between them and us if they happen to be lost. You know, it's happened. I've seen it happen <coughs> that people have come here that don't come here anymore that have come maybe two or three weeks in the summer and uh, maybe I'm burdened by it, but do they know what we are? Do they know that we just don't gather for church on Sunday and that's it? Do they know what Christianity is all about? So let me encourage you to maintain good works and to impress upon people that we're not just religious people. We're Christians working out our salvation. Let's pray. Our Father, truly we are...